believe it is right around page 326, okay, where we left off the other day, uh, last week, in Godric's Hollow. So they're, they're, they've made their way across the town square. They saw the memorial transform, okay, and they're now in the cemetery outside or behind the church. So they're in the, the churchyard cemetery, okay? Hallowed ground, so to speak. Uh, English traditional custom, only people who were Christians could be buried in the churchyard. If you weren't a Christian, you'd be buried outside the churchyard, okay? So they go in, and we're told deeper and deeper among the graves, Harry goes. Every time he reaches a new headstone, he feels a little lurch, and, and we're told. The darkness and the silence seemed to become all of a sudden much deeper. Harry looked around, worried, thinking of Dementors. Okay, now, notice that. It suddenly gets a whole lot darker, it seems. And Harry's first thought is, there's got to be Dementors around. Why? They shut out the light, seemingly. What else do they do? Cold? Dark. Dark? Harry looked around, worried, thinking of Dementors, then realized... The carols had finished, that the chatter and flurry of churchgoers were fading away as they made their way back into the square. Notice what Rowling does there. While the Christmas carols are being sung, Harry doesn't have a feeling or an emotion or an experience of sadness, darkness, heaviness. When those Christmas carols stop being sung, sadness, darkness, and heaviness, heaviness kinds of descends on him. Notice the Christmas carols are anti-dementors. I don't know. It depends on how good the people in the church sing. <laughs> you know, there's a couple of people in our church, you know, priest's daughter, I mean, she can, she can sing professionally, probably. Uh, there are a few others like me who you don't want to have them sing. So, so, we're told somebody inside the church had just turned off the lights. That's why it gets darker. There's our physical cause for the darkness. Whatever amount of light was coming through, probably stained glass windows. I've never seen a village church in England that doesn't have stained glass windows. Okay, So Hermione says, Harry, they're here. And we just left off with this the other day. And actually, we left off with previous page, Harry finds the Dumbledore burial plot, okay? Where it has this quotation. This is 324, 323 or so. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now this passage in Luke, okay, just one verse from a much, much longer passage about caring for the problems of tomorrow. Part of, part of this passage is about a, a rich man and Christ is telling a parable. A rich man who has a whole bunch of grain and he doesn't have enough barns to store all the grain. The barns he has are too small. So he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down these barns and I'm going to build bigger barns. And Christ says, fool, tonight you're going to die. Okay? You don't need to worry about the barns for tomorrow. And then he goes on and talks about, look at the lilies of the field. They don't care about how they're going to be fed, nutrients and such. Look at the birds. Look at sparrows. Okay? And the whole point is, where you put all your emphasis, that's where your heart is. Remember the mirror? Shows you your heart's desire. What's Harry's heart's desire? See all of his family? He's getting close. Okay? So, he sees this passage, and we're told, seeing the grave was worse than hearing about it. Harry could not help thinking that he and Dumbledore both had deep roots in this graveyard, and that Dumbledore ought to have told him so. He never thought to share the connection. That is, Dumbledore never thought to share the connection. They could have visited the place together. For a moment, Harry imagined coming here with Dumbledore. What kind of bond there would have been? How much it would have meant to him? But it seemed that to Dumbledore, the fact that their families lay side by side in the same graveyard, Harry doesn't know yet that his parents are there, does he? He hasn't been shown the graveyard, or the, the grave. That their families lay side by side in the same graveyard. 
had been an unimportant coincidence, irrelevant perhaps. Hermione's looking at Harry, and Harry reads the words again. He doesn't have a clue what they mean. Why? He's Harry? Okay, what does that mean? Okay, he's not real book smart. What else? Goes back to the Dursleys. No religious upbringing, right? What are we told about the Dursleys, the very first paragraph? They don't hold to anything strange or mysterious. They're very normal. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Most religions, if you want to talk about religion, generally not Christianity in particular, have some strange elements, right? They are elements that cannot be accounted for by sheer logic. Because most religions are, in one way or another, an attempt to explain something that is inexplicable. It can't be explained by logic, right? Dursleys, they're logical. They're what I call one day the logical positivists. If it can't be felt, tasted, touched, proved, verified, they don't have anything to do with that. Okay? Strict materialists, in other words. So they keep walking through, and Hermione notices what Harry thinks of as Xenophilius love goods mark. Right? She says, there's that mark in the book. Here, yeah, it could be. He doesn't care. He's looking for his parents. She finds a name. Okay. Here, I'm going to keep looking. That's when the darkness gets darker. The, the music stops. And then Hermione says, Harry, they're here. They're, they're, they're right here. Headstone, two rows behind Kendra and Ariana's. Made of white marble, like Dumbledore's. Made it easy to read. James Potter, born 27 March 1960, died 31 October 1981. Lily Potter, born 30 January 1960, died 31 October 1981. So she's about three months older than James. The last enemy that should be destroyed is death, which is from 1 Corinthians 15, 26. 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection for Christians. I don't mean the resurrection of Christians, but how important the resurrection is for Christians. It's in that book, in that chapter, that Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then we, Christians, of all people, are the most to be pitied. Because he essentially says, if there's no resurrection, we're damn fools. Because we're basing our entire life on this thing. Okay? So, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Harry reads that. And then he reads it aloud, kind of. And we're told, isn't that a Death Eater idea? Notice, he's never heard this from either of these two Gospels. Pretty clearly is the case then. He hasn't read them. Okay? And he's clearly never heard this. I think it's pretty safe to say Harry has never cracked a Bible. He's probably never seen one. I don't think the Dursleys have one. Probably likely Arabella Fig doesn't either. She's probably got some weird stuff, you know, in her house. Okay? So, why is that there? What, what do you mean? My parents Death Eater? Hermione's like, hey, shh. It doesn't mean defeating death in the way the Death Eaters mean it, Harry. It means, you know. Why does she say you know? What do we mean when we're talking with someone and we go, you know, you assume they know, right? Hermione knows. Her, nothing in the book tells us, you know, Hermione's some Bible-thumping Christian or anything like that. Doesn't Nothing in the book suggests Hermione reads the Bible. Okay? So how does she know? She... No, I think it's just the opposite of that. To say that she, her parents are muggles who are dentists, therefore it's safe to assume that they're religious. That's a non sequitur. The latter part is not supported by the first part. 
What is safe to assume is that she is raised, one, where? In England. What is going on, maybe not quite right now because it's 1222 in London, but what is going on tomorrow night at 6 p.m. almost anywhere in London, in any shopping store, what will you hear? Play it on the speakers. Go to any mall in America right now. What are you going to hear? Christmas music. Christmas music. Some of it might be good. Some of it might be, I don't know, Christina Aguilera and, you know, other monsters like that. Okay? <laughs> In my opinion. Okay? What is that Christmas music, at least some of it, maybe 10% of it, still reflect or discuss? Jesus, baby, Manger, Bethlehem, faithful, son of God, and Rudolph, and Santa, and the other stuff. That is, you cannot be a aware, living, breathing person in a post-Christian society, and I would say the United States and England are definitely both post-Christian, where at some annual celebrations, you have these kinds of things going on. Because what will happen sometime next April or March also? There will be Easter. Now, the vast majority of Americans don't celebrate Easter. Except for how? Easter sales. That is, it's become a commercial holiday. Well, Christmas is the same. So you're aware of it that way if no other way. Harry, oddly enough, it seems like has been raised in a bubble that he's not aware of any of this, even though throughout all seven books, I'll take that back, no, I can mention it, all seven books, what's it there in the sixth book? First five books in this book, you get Christmas carols mentioned every Christmas season. You have Christmas trees at Hogwarts. Hagrid carries the bim all the time. You get Peeves singing his dirty parody versions of Christmas carols. Okay? Parodies have no meaning if you don't have the real thing to parody. Right? So when Harry asks this kind of question, it's showing us he is totally in the dark, which is why book five, when Luna says, come on, you heard them. It's not like we'll never see them again. He's like, huh? What do you mean? What happens to the body or the soul after somebody dies, you know? So, she says it means, you know, living beyond death, living after death. Why well, do think Harry here is living after death, and what does he hear? Horcrux. Or the teacher in the old Charlie Brown cartoons. Wah, 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 wah. It doesn't make any sense. That doesn't. What do you mean? Living after death. That's an oxymoron, right? I mean, he might think of the ghost from Hogwarts. Which is solid proof that there is such a thing as living after death. Nearly had this Nick tells us what kind of living it is. It's a pale imitation. It's not really living. And he says, what about Sirius? He will have gone on. Notice who else that Harry has seen die is not walking around as a ghost. Cedric, Cedric and Dumbledore. Why? They went on. <laughs> it's pretty clear. Okay? So even Cedric at that moment that he died was prepared for it. See, all seven books, they are for they are teaching Harry one lesson, how to die. Okay? Because he doesn't know what death is in the first book. How do we know? He doesn't even know how his parents really died. He has to learn that in that first book. So, we're told. Harry's mind, okay, the narrator takes us into Harry's mind, but they weren't there. That is, there's, there's, there is no living after death. My parents are dead, Harry thinks. They were gone. 
What could he do to prove that? He could, almost dropped that. He could do the little spell that Peter Pettigrew did at the end of book four, right? Bone from the father and bring up James's ashes or the, what's left of his body. Thankfully, he doesn't. The empty words could not disguise the fact that his parents' moldering remains lay beneath snow and stone, indifferent, unknowing. What's hitting home? For the first time, I would argue, really in Harry's life. This is closure, folks. This is like seeing the corpse of your loved one. This is when it really hits. It's not in the third book when Harry hears his mother's voice or hears his father's voice, though that's getting close. It's now. This is when he feels in his bones. They're dead and they're not coming back. And there's nothing I can do about it. And tears 16 years of tears, right? He's never had this closure. This is why it's important after, you know, horrendous plane crashes. This is why it's important for families to get something. This is why it's so important when remains of MIA soldiers are brought back after 40 years from Vietnam or Korea or bodies discovered, you know, in a downed airplane buried somewhere in the fields of France. Happens about every one, about every five years. An old bomber from World War II is discovered, right? Even though most of the people's relatives are gone. And tears came before he could stop them. Boiling, hot, then instantly freezing on his face. And what was the point in wiping them off or pretending? He let them fall, his lips pressed hard together, looking down at the thick snow, hiding from his eyes the place where the last of Lily and James lay. What's wrong in Harry's thought? He's the last of Lily and James. Bones now, surely, or dust. Not knowing or caring. And yet what did we see when Harry looked in the mirror and he did this? That's when she cries. That's when she knows he sees me. <clears throat> and the tears start. And when the tears start, James puts his arm around her. That's happening when? Now. Now. And yet, at this moment, Harry's not remembering that. Why? Well, it's hard to remember something that happened five years earlier when you're confronted with the grave. Not knowing or caring that their living son stood so near, his heart still beating, alive because of their sacrifice, and close to wishing, at this moment, that he was sleeping under the snow with them. Hermione taking his hand, gripping it tightly. He doesn't look at her. He returns the pressure. And notice he's trying to regain control. He is going to regain control. It's going to take him quite a while. It's going to happen at Shell Cottage after he buries, excuse me, as he is burying Dobby, as he's digging Dobby's grave. That's when Harry will finally master himself. He will become his own master. And it could really be argued, I think, then, that's when he ultimately becomes the master of the Elder Wand, too. Okay? We'll talk about that when we get to it. So, Hermione she does a little magic, and there's a nice little Christmas wreath. Why is it a wreath? Why not a bouquet? Why wouldn't a bouquet be totally appropriate at this point? It's Christmas. It's England. Why a wreath? Okay, it's Christmas. Keep going. Infinity. Everlasting. Unending. That's why a wedding ring is a circle, plus it'd be kind of uncomfortable to wear a triangle 
or a square on your finger. The circle implies it's never ending. Okay? Roses. Why roses? Love, passion, okay? Depending on the color of the roses, because we're not told the color of the roses, if they're red, possibly blood. As soon as Terry stands up, he wants to leave. Okay? So they do. They go back to their tent. And in the chapter, Batilda's Secret, okay, um, hold on here. Then go back to the house. And there's a monument or a plaque. On this spot, this is um, page three, 332, I think, thereabouts. On this, on this spot, on the night of 31 October 1981, Lily and James Potter lost their lives. Their son Harry remains the only wizard ever to have survived the killing curse. This house, invisible to muggles, has been left in its ruined state as a monument to the Potters and as a reminder of the valley. Violence that tore apart their family. Okay. So he goes to Batilda Bagshots. Why? She comes and gets him. Okay. So Rita Skeeter gets her information. He figures she probably knows the truth about. Dumbledore. Okay. So, turns out not to be Matilda Bagshot, however. And we're going to skip a bunch. We get to the end of that chapter, and what do we find out happened to Harry's wand? Got broke. Got broke. Totally broke. And Hermione apologizes. I mean, I mean. Okay. She tells Harry, you ought to rest. And he asks, um, where's my wand? She reaches down beside the bed, held it out to him. The Holly and Phoenix wand was nearly severed in two. One fragile strand of Phoenix feather kept both pieces hanging together. The wooded splinter nearly completely apart. He takes it and he says, mend it, please. Like, you know, mendio. <laughs> And she's, um, Harry can't try. Uh, Reparo, he tries Lumos, Sparks, you know, Expelliarmus, and what Hermione's wand does kind of. She says, um, it was me, actually. As we were leaving, you know, the snake was coming for us, and so I cast a blasting curse, and it rebounded everywhere it must have hit. It was an accident. We'll find a repair, way to repair it. She goes, no, I don't think we can. He says, fine, I'll use yours. Beginning of the next chapter. Very first page. This is Harry's rock bottom moment. That is, before anyone can bounce back up, before anyone can go through the what what's called in religious devotional literature the dark night of the soul where they feel totally abandoned totally alone god if there is a god is totally you know walled you off etc you got to walk through this dark night of the soul and come out the other side well this is harry going through that dark night or you know to use the the language that alcoholics and such use this is hitting the bottom of the barrel. The only one place he can go from here. Uh, up. Do you think it's weird how she put it, his rock bottom so late in the, the span of the novels? No. I think it's entirely intentional. I think it's intentional that she does it on this particular day. What day is it? It's Christmas. The previous, the, the events of the night before were on Christmas Eve. Okay. So, we get this description. 
The sun was coming up. The pure, colorless vastness of the sky stretched over him, indifferent to him and his suffering. Now, just look at that image for a moment. Harry is seemingly outside. He's not in his tent looking up at the roof of the tent. He's outside, and the sun's coming up, and the sky is colorless. Notice it's not a deep blue or anything. It's probably, I don't know, it could be overcast. There's fresh snow on the ground, right? But we're told it's colorless and it's vast. It's never ending. And Harry thinks it is what? Indifferent to him and his suffering. In other words, the universe thinks what about Harry Potter? No, Doesn't nothing. <laughs> it thinks nothing about him. The cosmos thinks Harry is, that's it. Harry was down in the tent entrance, took a deep breath of clean air. It's cold air, right? Because it's snowy. So, I mean, that should kind of jar you a little bit. <clears throat> Simply to be alive, to watch the sun rise over the sparkling snowy hillside. Ought. What does ought mean? Who's it coming from? The narrator. This is our narrator speaking some editorial comment into this situation and saying, if Harry were in his right frame of mind, he would understand what a glorious thing this is. To be able to take a deep breath of fresh, clean mountain air on this morning and see this beautiful view out in front. I mean, this is like being in the Smokies. It's northern, it's actually, it's not Scotland, it's the Forest of Dean, which there are hillsides and such, okay? And just, you know, snow-covered trees and valleys, and way down in the valley, he sees and hears what? It's like how the Grinch stole Christmas. The Who's are down in Whoville, and they all start singing. It's Christmas morning. They're celebrating Christmas. Should have been the greatest treasure on earth. Kind of like this. Yet he could not appreciate it. Why not? His senses had been spiked by the calamity of losing his wand. Why is losing his wand a calamity? Yeah, we're going to be told very shortly. He's thinking it's his what against Voldemort? It's his ace in the hole, man. It saved him two years ago. Three years ago. Yeah, on its own. <laughs> Several months ago, on his birthday. He looked out over a valley blanketed in snow, distant church bells chiming through the glittering silence. Without realizing it, he's doing what? He's digging his fingernails into his skin as if he's trying to resist physical pain. He had spilled his own blood more times than he could count. He had lost all the bones in his right arm once. This journey had given him scars to his chest, forearm, to join those on his hand and forehead. What do we got there? Hands, head, chest. All he needs is a... Spike through the foot, and he's got the wounds of Jesus, okay? Not saying he's Jesus. But never until this moment that he felt himself to be fatally weakened. That's why I mean, he's at the bottom. He doesn't think he has what? He has no way to defend himself. What has Harry always been good at? Defense. Defending himself. He's never been good at attacking He's always been good at protecting himself. Okay? Keep in mind, what does a Patronus do? It defends. It's a shield. As though the best part of his magical power had been torn from him. But what does even Ollivander say about every wand? The wand chooses the maker. And what else? Where does its power come from? comes from within. 
The wand is merely like a magnifying glass. It merely channels and focuses. Harry's thinking about Hermione, thinking about his wand, thinking about what the wand did several months ago, but she had not felt the wand spin like the needle of a compass and shoot golden flames at his enemy. He had lost the protection of the twin cores. Twin cores. Hmm. So, he pulls the pieces of his wand out, looks at them. Fury at Dumbledore rises, and Hermione comes over, and she wants to talk a little bit. And he says, I'd be dead if you hadn't been there. And they look at the caption about Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Grindelwald. And then we get the title chaptered, The Greater Good. And so they read the chapter about Dumbledore and Grindelwald, including the letter from Dumbledore to Grindelwald. What is up until this point, what is our experience as readers of Grindelwald? What do we know about him? Bad guy, long time ago, defeated by Dumbledore in 1945. At that point, the most powerful dark wizard there was. Notice there's, like they say in Star Wars, there's always two. There's one hanging off in the you know wings, so to speak. And so we see Dumbledore's letter, which I'll read very quickly. Your point about wizard dominance being for the muggles on good. This, I think, is the crucial point. Yes, we have been given power. Yes, the power gives us the right to rule. What's the throne in the Ministry of Magic say? Magic, Magic is might. But it also gives us responsibilities over the rule. We must stress this point. It will be the foundation stone upon which we build. Where we are opposed, as we surely will be, this must be the basis of all our counter-arguments. We seize control for the greater good. But notice it's still, we seize Who else have we heard this argument from? No? Different series. This is the exact same thing Saruman says to Gandalf. We can join with Sauron and maybe turn him to our way, or maybe we can depose him, and then we can rule in his stead. Gandalf, of course, has the witty answer, only one finger can wear the ring. Who's it going to be, you know? And from this, it follows that where we meet resistance, we must use only the force that is necessary and no more. This is what shows us Dumbledore isn't a budding Marxist. Why? Because Marx said, you use power indiscriminately without any reason. For what purpose? Because you can. You slaughter merely to instill fear. Because you can. This was your mistake at Durmstrang. I don't complain, blah, blah, blah. Okay? They keep reading. Harry looks up. Hermione looks at Harry. Harry, he shakes his head. Why? Don't. Don't even start. Now, what did we read earlier, beginning of the book, that we were told did something to the idol Harry had created? Rita Skeeter, right? Because he had put Dumbledore on such a pedestal. All he could do was fall. He couldn't rise any higher than he already was. So now the image of Dumbledore that Harry has created, it's where? It's down there at the bottom of the barrel with Harry. So just as Harry has to rise, his false image of Dumbledore needs to have what happen to it? What do you mean? Like I'm like seeing he's just another person, not like some god that has dominant powers and does everything. 
it's got to get replaced with what? The real image of Dumbledore. Okay. Part of that comes when they meet up with Aberforth. How does Aberforth talk about his big brother? Like a lot of little brothers talk about their big brothers after they get older and stop idolizing their big brothers. Okay? I've got an older brother, so I know what he's talking about. So, he shook his head. He had trusted Dumbledore, believed him, here it is, the embodiment of goodness and wisdom. The embodiment. What day is this still? It's Christmas. Well, according to Christian theology, theology, what is Jesus? He is the embodiment, the in a body of God. Goodness and wisdom all rolled up in one package. Harry made Dumbledore into his God. You pretty much do that with any living, breathing person. Husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend. What? They're all going to do what to you? Everyone. They're going to disappoint you. That's a nice way of putting it. Letting you down. That's a nice way. They're going to screw you over one way or another a hundred times. Why? Because they don't do what we expect them to do. All was ashes. In the very next line, and I love it in the British edition, because right underneath the word ashes in the British edition is the word phoenix. I don't know that Rowling planned that. I don't think she can control the printing. But it's beautiful. Why? Because what does a phoenix do? And then it rises from its ashes. All right? So, they keep talking, and Hermione says, you read the letter to Grindelwald, right? And he says, yes, I did. And he thinks, for the greater good. Huh. And Hermione says, uh, I think that's the worst bit. Or she asks Harry that, and he says, yes. She says, yes. She says, for the greater good. That was Grindelwald's slogan. For the greater good was written over the entrance to Nurmengard. Okay? Harry doesn't know what Nurmengard is. It was Grindelwald's, you know, prison. Sounds very similar to Nuremberg. Okay? And that's where Grindelwald got put up. Okay? So they keep talking. And what does Hermione try to get Harry to see? And it's something that... that Hagrid repeatedly tells them, beginning with book two. Dumbledore says what about people? They can change. They can change. Which is why when Hagrid emphasizes to Arthur Weasley about getting in a fight with Malfoy is pointless because he's bad blood, rotten to the core. He's suggesting Malfoy can't change. Okay? And yet at the end of the book, he says, people can, Hagrid says, people can change. Okay? So, Hermione says, he changed, Harry. How old was Dumbledore when he wrote the letter to Grindelwald? Harry's age right now. He changed. It's as simple as that. This is page 362. Maybe he did believe these things when he was 17. But the whole of the rest of his life was devoted to fighting the dark arts. What did Dumbledore tell Cornelius Fudge at the end of book four? When Fudge has um, Moody, Barney Crouch Jr., kissed by the Dementors. It's not who we're born, but who we grow to be. Because according to Fudge's ideology, Barty Crouch Jr. should be what? He's a pure blood. Look at Lucius Malfoy. Pure blood, old line. Look at the Gaunts. Old blood. <laughs> pure blood. And one of them becomes Voldemort. 
What else? In the book two, he tells Harry what? Because Harry says, I should be in Slytherin. It is our choices, he tells Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. See, when Dumbledore makes those statements, he's making those statements. If we take the series as a whole and the character created as a whole, he's making those statements based upon what? Because I was a damn fool when I was 17, and I'm not making those same mistakes that I did then. That is, he developed, he moved away from that. Dumbledore was the one who stopped Grindelwald, the one who always voted for Muggle protection, Muggle-born rights, who fought you-know-who from the start, who died trying to bring him down. What's her point? Everyone can change. Okay? Harry, because Hermione says, you're angry because Dumbledore didn't tell you all this. Dumbledore, as I said, was 140, 150 years old. Harry's 17. Harry's a punk to Dumbledore. Harry, maybe I am. You're right, maybe I am angry. Dumbledore didn't tell me this. Look what he asked for me, Hermione. Harry doesn't know the half of what Dumbledore asked for him from him yet. Right? <clears throat> Risk your life, Harry. And again, and again. Show me one point in any of the previous six books where Dumbledore ever asked Harry to risk his life. Book one, did he tell him to go down into the chamber where the Philosopher's Stone was hidden? Nope. Book two, did he tell him how to get down into the Chamber of Secrets? Nope. Book three, did he tell him the entrance to the Shrieking Shack? Nope. Book four, nope. Five, nope. Six, nope. Never does Dumbledore intentionally either put Harry in harm's way or ask Harry to put himself in harm's way. What does Harry, as he tells Arthur Weasley, seem to have a knack of doing? finding trouble, finding himself in harm's way, right? His voice cracked with the strain, and Harry felt that they were as insignificant as insects beneath the wide sky. There are roaches in Harry's mind. How insignificant is that? Hermione, he loved you, Harry. I know he loved you. I don't know who he loved, Hermione. It wasn't me. This isn't love. The mess he's left me. He shared a damn sight more of what he was really thinking with Keller Grindelwald than he ever shared with me. Maybe a little clue about his love, you know. I don't know. He picks up her wand. Says, I'll take watch. Okay. And he goes and sits outside. And what's the next chapter? The first step on the climb back up. Notice it's a silver dough. Why silver? Why not a regular colored dough with a light inside? You know, it's a Patronus color. It's pure. Okay. So it's snowing. Harry has weird dreams. He goes back outside. They're in the Forest of Dean now. Sorry, earlier they weren't in the Forest of Dean. They were just outside um, Godric's Hollow. So now they're in the Forest of Dean. And Harry's sitting outside, we're told. A few days go by. And then we're told, page 364 or so, after two nights of little sleep, Harry's senses seem more alert than usual. Now, we're not told that this is literally two days after Christmas Day. Okay? We're just told after two days sleep, two nights sleep. Harry's wired, man. It's like he's on all kinds of caffeine. Okay? So he goes and he sits in the tent mouth and he looks outside. And he sees something out there. A bright silver light appeared right ahead of him, moving through the trees. Jumps to his feet. The thing comes closer. Stand comes out from behind an oak tree. Silver white doe, moon bright, dazzling, 
picking her way over the ground, still silent, leaving no hoofprints in the fine powdering of snow. She stepped towards him, her beautiful head with its wide, long-lashed eyes held high. Notice, no hoofprints in the snow. What does Harry know? I'm not a real deer. This isn't a flesh-and-blood deer. He looks at it and thinks, something's familiar about he felt that he had been waiting for her to come, but that he had forgotten until this moment that they had arranged to meet. His impulse to shout for Hermione had gone. Instead, the deer turns and goes back into the woods, and Harry follows it. Now, what would the rational mind say? No, Harry, don't do that. No, don't do It's stupid. Could be a trap. It's a deer. Right? So Harry goes off in pursuit. Through the darkness, though the darkness had swallowed her whole, her burnished image was still imprinted on his retinas. It obscured his vision, brightening when he lowered his eyelids, disorientating him. Now fear came. Why? Her presence meant safety. She's gone. He's therefore not safe. He says, Lumos and the wand tip just lights. It doesn't, you know, flare. He holds the wand higher. And the deer leads him to a spot. Something gleamed in the light of the wand, and Harry spun about. But all that was there was a small frozen pool, its cracked black surface glittering as he raised the wand higher to examine it. So he finds this little pool of water. We're not told how big it is. And he notices, one, it's frozen, but two, it's been broken recently because it's cracked. He moves forwards, he looks down, the ice shows him his reflection, but he also sees, down in the water, a great silver cross. Hmm. Drops to his knees, angles the wand, flood the bottom of the pool with as much light as possible, and there's a glint of deep red. So it's a cross with red on it. Any suggested images, symbolism? Yeah, tons of it. And then he realizes it's not a cross with red on it. That is, it's not a cross with blood. It's not Jesus' cross. It's a sword. And he remembers where he's seen one of those before. The sword of God Recriminator was laying at the bottom of the forest pool. The red are the rubies. Okay? And he's thinking, how is this possible? How could it have come to be lying in a fourth pool? Okay. And he says, no, nobody comes. So he tries, you know, to think of ways he could get the cross. He cracks the ice with Hermione's wand. It cracks with a sound like a bullet in the silence. The surface of the pool broke. Chunks of ice rock on the ruffled water. Harry thinks, not deep. I have to go all the way under to get it. That is, I can't lay on my stomach and reach down for it. I can't jump in, grab it with my foot, put my foot under the hill, kind of lift it up and reach down. I got to go all the way under. What's the image? It's baptism. Okay. And coming when it does, again, we don't know the date. But there is a Christian tradition, not in the Western Church, but in the Eastern Church, in the Orthodox Church, on what's called the Feast of Epiphany, which is January 6th, the 12 days of Christmas, are December 25th to January 6th. So when you sing that old Christmas carol with, um, you know, 12 days of Christmas, that's the two days between those 12 days, okay? In the Eastern Church, on the Feast of Epiphany, or what is called Theophany in the Eastern Church, there's a service called the Great Blessing of the Waters, where a priest goes out, says a bunch of prayers, dips a cross in the water three times, says a bunch of prayers, etc. And then, crazy as it sounds in some areas of the world, takes that cross and throws it out in the water. And the young men strip down to their shorts, 
and jump in the water to see who can retrieve it. Okay? They do this all over the place. Go down to Tampa St. Pete. There's a little community just north of Tampa St. Pete. has a pretty large Greek community. Do it all, they do it every December, uh, every January 6th. Well, the Gulf, in January 6th, you know, it gets really cold, down to like 70, 75 degrees. Bath water almost, okay? But they also do it in places like Michigan, in Lake Michigan, where it's a lot colder. And they also do it in places like Siberia, where in order to do it, they have to break the ice. And the ice is a foot or two thick. And so they go out there with ice breakers, and they break it so that it's manageable. And then they throw a cross out there. It's damn fool, you know, teenagers and guys in their 20s go out there and jump in their skinnies in the water and live, <laughs> first of all, and get the cross. That's, the, that's almost the image that she's using here. I don't know that she's, uh, she's not orthodox by any means, okay? So Harry has to go down into the water. Notice, what's he wearing? He's got the locket around his neck. Okay, moron. <laughs> so, but notice he's not a total moron. He tries the other ways first. He goes in, feet first. Can't feel it. And realizes he's got to go all the way under. So, he goes under. And when he goes under, it's like his suit and his, as his head goes under the water, what happens? It starts to choke him. He starts to drown, which means, I don't know, you know if you've ever started to drown or had drowning experience, not symptoms. Yeah. Uh, once when I was like, I don't know, three, five years old, we were at the beach because grew up in California, and I got hit by massive waves. My dad, mom, and my siblings, you know, my aunt, uncle, and a couple of their kids were there, too. You know, my dad and mom all laughed and stuff. My uncle was the one who was a doctor. He was the one who ran out and saved it because, I mean, I was, you know, sucking seawater and stuff. Anyways, Harry goes under, and he starts, and he's dying. He's literally dying, okay? He kicks out wildly, trying to push himself back to the surface. Notice, he doesn't kick off from the ground. He just kicks in some direction. The whole thing, you know, if you ever find yourself in an undertow, find the find the surf, find the, the shore, the bottom of the water, and push up. So arms that closed around his death, his chest were surely death, choking and retching. He pulls, he's pulled up. Harry had no strength to lift his head and see his savior's identity. And we hear a voice. Are you mental? Well, there's only one person in all of the books. I'll take that back. It's three, actually. Who used that word? Ron and Fred and George. Okay. Are you mental? What the hell? Ron asks. Okay. Harry, it was you? That is, you cast it. Ron, no, I don't know what you're talking about. My Patronus is a stag. Okay. So... They find Hermione. Hermione welcomes Ron back with loving open arms, right? No. Why not? He deserved it. Got to keep him on his toes. She's going to make she's going to make him work for it, okay? Cuz he abandoned them. So, Ron destroys the Horcrux with the sword. We're going to skip a bunch. They don't do all the nonsense stuff like it's in the movie. Chapter 20. Xenophilius loved it. Question? Yes. Um, the part where you said that Ron was the one that got the, or the first one that got the swords, it looked like it says when he carries off the Ron, Ron says, oh yeah, I brought it out. And then he says, that's why you jumped in the water. Where? Okay, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's like my yeah. sister. That's before then. How did you get your talking about how, did how Harry and, uh, or how Ron was the one that got the sword out of the water. That's why he was the one that she destroyed the sword. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was it. Yeah, I got a great point. I'm trying to find. It's around page 
Yeah, it is in the um, in the American one, and this is what I'm wondering. It'd be a massive thing. Just why the hell? Here it is. Why the hell? I'm so I stick with it now. Oh yeah. How come you here? Apparently, why I hope this point would come up later. If at all, well, you know, come back, you know, so let me pause. Ron looked out of his hands to see momentarily of surprise to see the things we told him. Yeah, I got it out. He said rather unnecessarily, holding up the sword for his inspection. That's why he jumped in, right? Yes, I don't understand. Okay. Well, that's that's good job. I need to. <laughs> really looked at it. Okay. Okay, so pick up with Xenophilius Lovegood. Um, anybody know what his name means? Okay. Xeno, others, or aliens. <coughs> If you are xenophobic, big word used around today, it means you fear aliens. Phileus means love of or lover of. If she had spelled this with an F, F-I-L-I-U-S, it would mean brother of. Okay? So, xenophilius... Love good. Love of others. Love good. Love the good. Love what's good. Plato said, Plato? Yeah, it was Plato. Plato said that we are to love, we are to seek the sumum bonum. highest good. That's the purpose of, of human life. To seek out, to search for the highest good, whatever the greatest the greatest good. That's why Dumbledore, you know, and Grindelwald title their manifesto that. Okay? Their greatest good idea is a little bit different, however, than you know the others. So they go off to Xenophilius Love Good to talk with him. Why? Because of the mark which he was wearing on his gown. Okay? And we're going to skip the rest of that chapter and go straight to 21. Uh, Tale of the Three Brothers. So, they start talking with him about the Deathly Hallows. And he says about the Deathly Hallows, Second paragraph in the first page. One simply uses the symbol to reveal oneself to other believers. What does that sound like? You, you'll see in ads today things like this. It's the quote unquote Christian fish. And then you'll see on you know bumper stickers on cars, you know, with little things like this and Darwin, you know, put in there to make fun of Christians and stuff. Okay. Same kind of thing, and you'll see all kinds of other stuff. So, what's he talking about? Believers. some Almost like a religious belief. Okay? In the Deathly Hallows. In the hope that they might help one with the quest. Harry, uh, what are you talking about? Well, you see believers seek the Deathly Hallows. Hermione, what are they? Okay. He says, well, the whole thing starts with the tale of the three brothers. And Hermione goes, wait, 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 I've got that. Dumbledore gave me that book. What's the tale of the three brothers? By the way, J.K. Rowling rips it off from Geoffrey Chaucer. It's from the partner's tale in the Canterbury Tales. Slightly differently told. Okay? You have three brothers. They're drunks. In the Canterbury Tales version. Three brothers, they're drunks. They're at a pub one night. Being rowdy is all hell. And 
drunk. And they hear about this guy who's killing people in the county next. Okay? And his old man comes into the pub and says, Yeah, I heard about him. You know, go down here, take a left, and keep it. Tells them where to find this old guy. So they're going to go kick who they were killing all these people, you know what? And they go off, and they go to the spot where the old man said, the person who's killing everybody could be found. And what they find is a pile of treasure at the foot of a tree. And so they kind of lose track of going and finding the guy who's killing people because they found this pile of treasure. And so the three brothers decide, well, we're going to split up. But they need more to drink. Because, I mean, they're blasted, but they need a lot more to drink because now they're really going to celebrate. So, one of the brothers says, I'll go into town, I'll get more beer, and come back. Cool, you do that. So he goes off into town. The two brothers say, hey, you know what? This would be a lot nicer divided by two than it would by three. Let's kill him when he comes back. Sounds good. Meanwhile, the brother who ran off to town thinks, that'd be a lot nicer divided by one than it would by three. So he stops at the local apothecary, the druggist, the pharmacy, and he gets some poison. And he puts poison in their bottles, so he has his own bottle, okay? So he gets back, they kill him, they drink their bottles. All three die. It's all about greed, the sin of greed. The, the basis for this tale, which is told by a preacher, is Renix Malorum S. Cupiditas, from the book of Timothy, one of the books of Timothy in the New Testament. The root of all evil is greed. Okay? Now, she takes that and she modifies it a little bit, right? She modifies it how? Question? Comment? Well, no, I was just wondering, because wasn't the old man in that story supposed to be dead? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he was getting more recruits, essentially. Okay. So, we see the, the story um, told in pages 466, 67 or so and following. Okay. And what are the three hallows? The elder one, the resurrection scene, and the cloak of invisibility. Cloak of invisibility, elder one. Resurrection stone. Okay. Sorry. So those are the those are the three deathly hallows. He shows a picture of the one. He shows a you know drawing of the stone. Okay. Hermione says, but but there's no mention of the words deathly hallows in the story. Notice Hermione's a literalist. Okay. He says, well of course not. It's a children's tale told to amuse rather than to instruct. Those of us who understand these matters, however, recognize that the ancient story refers to three objects or hallows, which, if united, will make the possessor master of death. And he says, Luna should have your stuff ready soon. Okay. And he goes on and he talks a little bit, and Hermione, you know, she goes, You don't really think this is or exist, do you? He says, Well, of course. And he says, Luna has told me all about you, young lady. You are, I gather, not unintelligent. Now that's not a a real strong uh, word of praise, but painfully limited, narrow, close-minded. True or false? Is Hermione narrow and close-minded? Ooh, fight! <laughs> because all she all she cares about is nonfiction. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Whenever they were in um, Department of Mysteries, she was terrified of everyone that was in there because she thought they were stealing her stuff. But I just think that's a little nonsense. She just wants to be safe. 
thing she doesn't understand, she closes off. She's not willing to investigate. She's not willing. She, she doesn't open her mind to that. Well, divination's a fraud. <laughs> As even Dumbledore says, okay? So, Hermione says, maybe, uh, Ron says, maybe she's trying to add stuff. So he goes on. Hermione says, but, okay, so we all know there are such things as invisibility cloaks. I mean, they're rare, but they exist, right? Because how many have we heard about? Well, there's Harry's. And Mad Eye has had at least two. Because he loaned one and never, never got returned. And he still had another one. Okay? He says, ah, but the third hallow is a true cloak of invisibility. Well, what does that mean? It's not a traveling cloak imbued with a disillusionment charm or carrying. No. This one will hide one in uh, this one really and truly renders the wearer, wearer completely invisible. Problem? Book two. Harry, Ron, and, Hi and Heine, Hermione <laughs> hide under Harry's invisibility cloak in Hagrid's hut. And who sees him? Dumbledore. Who else sees through the invisibility cloak? Mad Eye Moody. Is it Voldemort? Does it count Voldemort too for it? Voldemort can't. In fact, even in um in the fourth book, when Harry gets his foot stuck in the one stair, and he loans the the um, Marauder's map to Moody. Okay, Harry's got the cloak on, Moody sees him, and he talks to Snape and gets Snape to leave. And Harry says, thanks, you know, for and he said, Harry tells him about the map, and he goes, well, that sounds pretty interesting. Can I borrow that map there, Miss Potter? You know, okay. So, it endures eternally, giving constant impenetrable concealment. Now, I've heard people say impenetrable means you can't throw a spell at somebody under it, and haven't heard of it. To me, impenetrable, mean, impenetrable means it cannot be penetrated by anything, including sight. Well, you know how legends get modeled. Sure. No matter what spells are cast at. So how many cloaks have you seen like that, Miss Granger? And she kind of participated me about it. I've seen one. Yeah. So he asks, talks about the resurrection stuff. And he says, what of it? Well, how can that be real? Proof that it's not. Hermione, but you expect me to get hold of all the pebbles in the world and test them? I mean, you could claim that anything's real if the only basis for believing in it is that nobody's proved it doesn't exist. And he says, gotcha. And he says, <laughs> he doesn't literally say gotcha. He says, I'm glad to see you're opening your mind a little. Why does rolling include that in there? I think that's included for, oh, I just remembered his last name, for that author I was telling you about two weeks ago. I think that's his name. Grossman. Lev Grossman. <laughs> Whoever the guy was who said, you know, the person that, Harry, that J.K. Rowling kills in the seventh book is God. Because he says God's nowhere to be found in the book. And she says, I don't think he's as absent as you think he is. Because this is the argument that has been used, an argument that has been used against a lot of atheists. Prove that God doesn't exist. You know, and the flip side is prove that he does. Well, what's the problem with both of those? You can't. You can't. Okay? So, Harry said, all right, skip those two things. Elder one, let's get to that one. Because he's, you know, got this broken stick in his pocket. Well, there's all kinds of evidence about that. And Harry asks, what is the evidence? And so he starts to go through it with them. Okay. They talk about the grave. Hermione mentions having seen the symbol. Okay. And he tells them the names of the three brothers, the three Peveril brothers, were Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignotus. I could be stretching things here because I am Orthodox. I'm Eastern Orthodox, okay? Ignotus, 
is the same name as Ignatius. An early, very, very huge, big, important saint in the Christian church is a guy named Saint Ignatius of Antioch. There's two names right there. He was one, go back to the scene in book six, when Harry finally understands what the real what the prophecy really means. And we're told he came to understand it was the difference between marching into the arena, head held high, and being dragged in. St. Ignatius of Antioch was arrested by the Romans in about 110 AD and was taken to Rome to be thrown to the lions. He had all kinds of supporters, all kinds of friends. He was a bishop. All kinds of people who wanted to buy his freedom. They said, we will pay your guards to let you go. He said, no, don't. Why? His words, I want to be a true Christian. That is, I really want to be like Christ. I need to die for this. And so he argued. He wrote seven letters. They still survive. About what all that means. I think that's where J.K. Rowling gets that image that she uses in book six, okay? So, he asked them to stay for dinner. Why do we come to learn later? Yeah, he's setting them up, okay? So, Hermione says, a couple pages later, he's gone off, so the three of them are talking, and Hermione says, Harry and I were raised by muggles. We were taught different superstitions. What's a superstition? Give me an example of one. Moon landing is fake. Okay. Walking under a ladder. Breaking a mirror. Having a black cat, black cat cross your path. Don't do any of those, right? Those are all superstitions. Supposedly, you do one of those and you're going to get what? Bad luck, some of them for seven years. Okay. Interesting little factoid just saw it today. Apparently there was an NFL game earlier this year. Two of the football teams that were playing have cat nicknames. I don't know what they were, the Jags and somebody else. Panthers. And a black cat ran on the field. None of the NFL teams that have cat nicknames have won since that game. That could build what? That could build a superstitious belief about killing all black cats near football stadiums. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so Hermione says, we were taught different superstitions. Was Harry? Harry does, apparently doesn't have any superstitions. Okay, So, she says, it's just a morality tale. That is the tales of Beetle the Bard. The Tale of the Three Brothers. It's obvious which gift is best, which one you choose. What does she mean, it's just a morality tale? It's just a tale to tell, to emphasize certain moral truths, like Aesop's <coughs> Fables, which I know people don't read Aesop's Fables anymore. But they used to be taught to emphasize certain virtues, certain ideas, certain truths. Okay? She says, it's clear. Which of these is best? How clear is it? Clear as mud, right? Because what does Harry want? What does Ron want? What does Hermione want? Why does Hermione want the cloak? Think about that for a moment. I mean, it's easily understandable why Harry wants the stone, right? Serious, boom, back to life, you know? Mom and Dad, boom, back to life. Ron, the wand, look at me. Ruler of all, you know, pretty clear. And that's what Ron would do. He has that streak in him. Why does Hermione want the invisibility cloak? Okay. I can understand that. It's also what the, like she said, it's just a morality tale. And that's what the Fables are about, how everything is in the past. Mm -hmm. I guess that could be seen as like it's she's seen an invisibility cloak, so that's like the only real thing from the story that she has proof of. Well, 
from the eyes of just like reading the story, there there are two options that always end in bad stuff, and there's one option that is presented as the clear okay good choice. Maybe she's just being logical. No, I don't think she's being logical. I actually don't think she's being a lot. Well, I mean, logical she like she in the lines with the story. Like when reading the story, you come to understand that. Let her what problem does Hermione have? Let's put it this way. In classrooms. She's being called a know-it-all. Yeah. Uh, not in classrooms. She's a know-it-all. Professor asks a question, what does she do? <laughs> Everybody knows what about Hermione? She's, all brain. She's a brainiac, right? She knows everything. Even Luna's father has said, I've heard about you. When they meet Neville's grandmother, I've heard about you. You help them. Does she want some anonymity? I'm just asking. I don't know. It's the one. It's the one I don't understand. I mean, it would let her. You know, also, it would her out this conflict that she's not necessarily a part of. Okay. She could hide from this ever going wizard first. But uh, what would that mean, though? Turning her back on Harry. She's not going to do that. Well, I meant just like the whole like pure blood versus. Okay, blood yeah, thing. possibly. It would just hide her from this greater conflict. Notice what Ron says. You're supposed to say cloak. That is, if it's only a morality tale, then that's the answer you're supposed to say. Hermione, you're doing that because that's what you're supposed to, that's what the good moral person says. Notice what Ron's kind of doing there. I'm not the good moral person. I want the power, baby. I want to, you know. <laughs> Harry, we've already got a this really cool. You know, look. And it's helped us rather a lot, says Hermione, don't you think? Whereas the wand would be bound to attract trouble. Because what happens if you're walking around and you have a sign on you that says, I am the Elder Wand? <laughs> you know, yeah, Avada Kedavra, you know, from the back and such. Ron, only if you shouted about it, only if you were proud enough to go dancing around, waving it over your head and singing, that kind of unbeatable Avada, you know? Hello, Ron. <laughs> okay. Hermione, yes, but could you keep your trap shut? Notice it's not you could, it's could you. Look, you know, the only true thing he said to us was that there have been stories about extra powerful. So they keep talking, okay? And they ask about Luna, and they realize, you know, Luna's not there. They get nearly captured. Uh, okay, the next chapter, definitely out, since we've got to get through a lot faster than we are. Um, second page, around 425 or so, towards the bottom. Hermione says, I never heard such a lot of nonsense in all my life. Ron, hang on. Chamber of Secrets was supposed to be a myth. It wasn't. But the Deathly Hallows can't exist, Ron. Notice, she says they can't. Why? It's not logical. It doesn't fit into her framework of what the world looks like. Notice, Harry's framework of what the world looks like is quite a bit larger. Why? What happened to him when he heard Petunia say they guard the wizard prison in Azkaban? His two separate worlds were shown not to be separate. Hermione still thinks of them as separate. She, she doesn't allow she doesn't see the wizarding world in the same way that Harry does. So, Hermione, it is a story. A story about how humans are frightened of death. If surviving was as simple as hiding under the invisibility cloak, we'd have everything we need already. Harry, I don't know. We could do with an unbeatable wand. There's no such thing, Harry. Notice what Hermione says. It's a story about people frightened of death. Well, that's kind of what all seven books are about. 
But I would argue putting on my amateur psychologist hat, which I don't have by any means. I hate psychology. It's a bunch of sorry. It's J.K. Rowling wrestling with death throughout all seven books. It's J.K. Rowling saying, it's not fair. Because it's not fair for a 25-year-old to lose her mother to breast cancer when her mother was only 45. It's not fair to anybody. It's not fair to us that her mother died at that age. You know, some people would say, yeah, but it's good that she did. Because look what it produced. Okay? Sick, twisted. So, Harry goes back. When my wand connected, when you know who's, it made my mom and dad appear, and Cedric. But they weren't really back from the dead, Harry. Those were pale imitations. They're not the same as truly bringing someone back to life. And Harry says, the girl in the story didn't really come back, did she? The story says that once people are dead, they belong with the dead. But the second brother, he still got to see her. Notice what's not said. That the dead just stop. Okay. Harry. So the Peveril bloke who's buried in Goblet's Hollow, you don't know anything about it? She goes, no. Harry. Marvolo Gaunt. In the pencil. He's descended from the Peverells. The ring. The ring became the Horcrux. Marola Gott said it had the Peveril coat of arms. She's like, what did it look like, Harry? Harry says, I only saw it after it was cracked open. And he's like, <laughs> so notice what Harry's starting to do. He's putting hallows with Horcruxes. Right. So, question about when, when he's like when he's talking about like the drawing of these items, is it like a in depth drawing, or is it just like the, the circle? Okay. Um. Um. Hook. And then you put them together. Okay. So, skipping a few more pages. What is this? Uh, Eighty pages. Somewhere around 433, 435, somewhere in there. Harry's thinking. He remembers the snitch, right? I open at the close. What's the close? I couldn't have. Why did he have the stone now? Elder one, where's that hidden? Where's Voldemort searching? Harry's thinking. Voldemort. He and Voldemort are reunited. They, we want the same thing. Hermione wouldn't like that idea because Hermione doesn't believe. Well, what was Harry's problem throughout the entire first half of the book? He Did believe. He can't believe. Did they really think it was as simple as choosing what to believe? Now he believes. He doesn't believe in Dumbledore. He believes in the Horcruxes. Xenophilus had been right. Limited, narrow, close-minded. She's scared of the idea of the Deathly Hallows. Why? Because that opens a door that she's afraid to walk through. Notice how fast, back in book five, Harry goes down those steps in the Room of Death in the Ministry of Magic. It's like he's down there at that little dais that has the archway with the veil, while Hermione's still back up at the door, Harry, she, she's afraid to go in there. Why? It cannot be understood. It cannot be logically figured out. That's why it is a mystery. Okay? It was as though a flame had been lit inside him that nothing, not Hermione's flat disbelief, nor Ron's persistent doubts could extinguish, we're told. That's in the paragraph they packed up the tent the next morning, etc. And Harry starts to think more. And he remembers it was over here. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay? He has a vision. This is around 
for, I don't know, 35 or so. The vision team of Voldemort were sharing had changed in quality. They had become blurred, shifting as though they were moving in and out of focus. Harry was just able to make out the indistinct features of an object, object that looked like a skull and something like a mountain that was more shadow than substance. Why is he having an image of a mountain that looked like a skull? Or is it something that looks like a skull and something else that looks like a mountain? Again, I don't know about you, but by putting these two images as close together as she does, and knowing what she said to that interviewer in around 2002, that if she were to talk about her Christianity, it would give away some of the ending, there's a name of a mountain that looks like a skull. It's called Golgotha. It's where Christ was crucified. Okay? So, they keep talking, horcruxes, hallows, etc., etc. They listen to the radio, whatever it's called, the wireless, page 440, and they hear Kingsley Shacklebolt. They hear Kingsley, they hear Lee, Thomas, they hear Lupin, Kingsley says, Muggles remain ignorant of the source of their suffering as they continue to sustain heavy losses. And then he goes on and says, Every human life is worth the same and worth saving. Human implies what? Muggle or wizard. Muggle or wizard. Notice, who doesn't consider himself human? Voldemort. Voldemort. He considers himself superhuman, uber mensch. We can kill him. Okay. They hear Lupin, and Lupin says, "The boy who lived remains a symbol of everything for which we are fighting: the triumph of good, the power of innocence, the need to keep resisting." It worked. Harry's calling Lupin a coward worked. So, they keep listening, they get caught and taken off to Malfoy Manor. Now it gets a little difficult. What do we see? Uh, hold on a second, a few pages, a few pages, 84 pages in. <clears throat> Somewhere around 450 or so. They take Harry, Ron, and Hermione to Draco, because Narcissa says Draco's home for his Easter holiday. Okay. And they ask Draco to take a look, take a close look. Draco comes up really close to Harry. Now, why doesn't Harry look like Harry? Hermione. Hermione put a hex on him, made his face all swollen, like he's got been stung by hornets and stuff. Harry saw Draco's face up close now, right beside his father's. They're extraordinarily alike, except that while his father looked beside himself with excitement, got Potter, got Potter in my house. Draco's expression was full of reluctance, even fear. And Draco says, I don't know. Does Draco really not know? Now, we don't know, right? It's not clear. Draco might not know. What do you think? He knows. Yeah. <laughs> he knows. How does he know? Ron and Hermione. <laughs> Who else is it going to be? It's not Colin Creevy. Okay? No, I couldn't. <laughs> they wouldn't hang around with Colin Creevy. They'd kill him, probably. Um, okay. So, they send Ron and Harry downstairs. Meanwhile, what's Beltrix going to do to Hermione? Have fun. <laughs> okay. Ron says, no, 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 take me, take me, et cetera, et cetera. They go down. There's Luna. Who else is in the? Ollivander. Ollivander's in the basement or cellar. Who else? Dean. Grip Hook. Dean. Okay. So, who comes to get Harry before that? Peter. Peter Pettigrew. He comes down, and Harry says, uh, around 460 or so, 465, you're going to kill me? 
After I saved your life, you owe me, Wormtail. And the silver fingers slackened. Harry had not expected it. He wrenched himself free, astonished, keeping his hand over Wormtail's mouth. He saw the rat-like man, rat -like man, small, watery eyes, wide with fear and surprise. He seemed just as shocked at what his hand had done. Notice what his hand had done. This is the hand Voldemort he gave him. At the tiny, merciful impulse, it had betrayed. And he continued to struggle more powerfully as though to undo that moment of weakness. So they take his wand. And then we see his hand goes to his own throat. And Harry tries to stop it. Without pausing to think, Harry tried to drag back the hand, but there was no stopping it. The silver tool that Voldemort had given his most cowardly servant had turned upon its disarmed and useless owner. Pettigrew was reaping his reward for his hesitation. Okay. We're not told specifically that they watch Pettigrew as his eyes bug out and his face turns blue and he is strangled, but that's what happens. Okay. So Dobby comes, gets everybody else out, and in the last page, he comes, he gets Harry, and as they're disappearing, Bellatrix throws the knife, and Harry sees Dobby. <clears throat> the elf swayed slightly, stars reflected in his wide, shining eyes. Together, he and Harry looked down at the silver hilt of the knife protruding from the elf's heaving chest. Dobby, no, help, help who did not know or care whether there were wizards or muggles, friends or foes. All he cared about was that a dark stain was spreading across Dobby's front. And then he'd stretched out his thin arms to Harry with a look of supplication. What's a look of supplication mean? Help me, Harry Potter. And he dies. Chapter 24, The Wand. Elf had gone where he could not call him back. So, towards the bottom of that page, that, that next long paragraph, his rage was dreadful, and yet Harry's grief for Dobby seemed to diminish it, so that it became a distant storm. Why? What's meant by Harry's grief for Dobby? It tames Voldemort's hate. We've already seen that. Um, no, before then. Second book. Harry's really angry when he hears. No, take that back. Third book. Really angry when he hears that Sirius Black was his father's best friend. And he wants to go down and talk to Hagrid about it. And they go down, they march down to Hagrid's, and Hagrid's got tears rolling out of his face. Because he's lost his appeal and Buckbeak's going to be killed. And what happens? All, his anger all, of his all of Harry's anger is turned. Why? Because he can't be full of hatred and love at the same time. And what wins? Love wins. Remember the great argument? The old argument? Love or, love or, dump or Voldemort's kind of power is stronger. Okay. Harry says, I want to do it properly, not by magic. Why is digging a grave by hand proper and not magic? For Dobby, a completely magical being. I cannot totally understand if it were Ron. Because Ron's magical, but he's also human. Okay. Dobby doesn't have a shred of humanity. He is a Totally magical being. <clears throat> okay. Work work? Or magical work? That is, for example, the house elves in the kitchens at Hogwarts. Do they slave over those fires? Or is it all, you know? I mean, it could just be respect. I mean, Dobby's not human, but Harry is. And that's his way of... He's humanizing him. He's making him similar to himself. He's showing that, okay? Yeah. Because look what happens while he digs. 
He dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it. It's almost like Carrie's tired of magic. For every drop of his sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf who had saved their lives. His scar burned, but he was master of the pain. This is when Harry finally gets total self-mastery. Because notice, as he did, he knows exactly what Voldemort is thinking. He knows what Voldemort wants. He knows exactly what Voldemort's going to do. And yet Harry doesn't stop, does he? He doesn't say, I've got to get back to Hogwarts. I've got to desecrate Dumbledore's tomb. I've got to rifle through the old man's bones and find the older one. Which is exactly what he knows he needs to do. He had learned control at last. He learned to shut his mind to Voldemort, the very thing Dumbledore had wanted him to learn from Snape. Grief, it seemed, drove Voldemort out, though Dumbledore, of course, would have said that it was love. An understanding blossomed in the dark. Understanding of what? That what is love? That love is more powerful than Voldemort's kind of magic? That love is the greatest power? Steady rhythm of his arms beat with his thoughts, and he thought of Wormtail. Why? Dead because one small unconscious impulse of mercy. Who killed Wormtail? What did the hand do? And what is that? Betrayed. Betrayed. That is, he showed that ounce of mercy. If he hadn't, Harry wouldn't be here digging Dobby's tomb, right? So, he puts Dobby in the tomb. But what does he do first? He puts him in clothes. Harry wrapped the elf more snugly in his jacket. Ron sat on the edge of the grave, stripped off his shoes and socks, which he put on Dobby's bare feet. Dean gave him a hat. Notice, he doesn't just get a single piece of clothing. He's dressed. Dressed for his burial. They close his eyes. And Luna speaks his eulogy. Thank you so much, Dobby, for rescuing me from that cellar. It's so unfair that you had to die when you were so good and brave. I'll always remember what you did for us. I hope you're happy now. Dean says, thanks. Harry swallows. Bye, Dobby. He asks if he can stay alone. And he puts on a stone. Here lies Dobby, a free elf. Why? Free at last, free at last. Like the old Negro spiritual. Thank God Almighty. Free at, free at last when? Free of hamlets, slings and arrows of the outrageous fortune of this world. The one thing Voldemort is trying to tie himself to all throughout the books because he's afraid of what's next. And his mind is full of all kinds of thoughts, okay? So, he thinks of the piercing blue mirror in the fragment. He thinks of Dumbledore saying, help will always be given at Hogwarts to people who ask for it. And we're told, he looked out over the ocean and felt closer to this dawn than ever before, closer to the heart of it all. And if you could tell me what Harry means, you have an A. Because I've been reading this for seven, 12 years, and I still haven't figured out what exactly that means. The heart of it all. His scar prickles. He knows Voldemort's getting there, too. Not getting there. He knows Voldemort is figuring it out. Notice, Harry figured it out before Voldemort. Why is Voldemort getting there now? Because there's the connection. Voldemort's getting it from Harry this time. And Harry just stays put. 
The Dumbledore and Harry's head smiled, surveying Harry over the tips of his fingers, pressed together as if in prayer, and says, Harry thinks, you gave Ron the deluminator, deluminator you understood him. You gave him a way back. You understood Wormtail. You knew there was a bit of regret there. You knew them. What did you know about me, Dumbledore? Am I meant to know but not to seek? Did you know how hard I'd find that? Is that why you made it this difficult? So I'd have to work that out? That's why he's the seeker. And he sees the, his, the outline of Hogwarts. He sees the white tomb. He knows exactly what Voldemort's doing. Okay? So he has to go talk to Ollivander and a grip hook. Ollivander explains, you don't have to kill the previous owner to be master of the Elder Wand. And what does Harry understand from that? Drum Dumbledore was a master of the Elder Wand when he died. Draco was. Who's the master of the Elder Wand now? At this point? Nope. Harry. Why? He, he, disarmed, he disarmed Draco at Malfoy Manor. He doesn't have it in his possession. So, Harry tells Ron and Hermione what's going on. They're like, dude, we should go there. Harry's like, nope, too late. He knows where it is. He's there now. The last couple pages of the chapter. Hold on. Ron says, Harry, how long have you known this? Why have we been wasting time? We could have gone. Okay. No, said Harry, and he sank to his knees in the grass. Why? Why does he fall to his knees? No, nope, it doesn't have anything to do with time of day. I like morning. Okay, I see what you mean. Hermione's right. Dumbledore didn't want me to have it. He didn't want me to take it. He wanted me to get the Horcruxes. Physically, being on your knees... It's a physical act of humility. He's falling on his knees before what? Dumbledore's wishes. Okay. You know what you're doing. You, you, you've got this plan. <laughs> and he's acquiescing to it. Chris? In the forest, because you, you mentioned the Elder Wand, when all of that happened, yes, Harry died, but do you think that's why he, like, didn't stay dead? Because the older one... We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay? So... Uh, we're going to skip a bunch. So, they go to Green Gods, and we get our, you know, Universal Studio Tour ride on the dragon. Skip that chapter entirely. <laughs> Go to the final hiding place. Nope, skip that chapter. Missing mirror. Jesus and Peter were pretty cool. Though. Yeah. Jesus. Missing mirror. They go back to the hogshead. They meet Aberforth. And Aberforth tells Harry, at about 560 or so, 567 or so, Harry says, we're not leaving. We need to get into Hagrid. Don't be stupid, boy, etc., etc." Harry says, Dumbledore left me a job. Aberforth says, did he now? Nice job, I hope. Pleasant, easy, sort of thing you'd expect an unqualified wizard kid to be able to do. Harry, no, not easy, but I've got to. Got to. Why well, got to? He's dead, isn't he? Let it go, boy, before you follow him. Save yourself. Well, Harry can't save himself. Why? Because he's the chosen one. How chosen is he? Is he chosen by God? Is he chosen by Dumbledore? No. He's chosen by Voldemort. Voldemort made him the Messiah. Voldemort messiahed him, if you want. Okay? And he's going to do it again. In the Forbidden Forest. Save yourself... And Harry says, can't do it. Why not? Harry, notice he doesn't answer. He just says, you're fighting. You're in the Order of Phoenix. I was. It's finished. You know who's won. Okay. 
thing. But they keep talking, and we find out not quite, and Everforth hasn't totally given in. We're told uh, around 460, I don't know, two or so, paragraph begins, Harry kept quiet. He did not want to express the doubts and uncertainties about Dumbledore that had ridden him for months now. He had made his choice. Notice, that's a conscious decision. He's not just, ooh, how do I feel? He made his choice while he dug at Dobby's grave. What was the choice? To continue along the winding, dangerous path indicated for him by Dumbledore. Notice, winding, dangerous path indicated. Does indicated mean laid out like with landing lights for an airplane? No. It's more yeah. Like air, a little wide. It's kind of like, there's a wall there. <laughs> there's a wall there. So I'm going to... To accept that he had not been told everything that he wanted to know, but simply to trust. And what was it Lupin and Arthur Weasley told him at Christmas in the sixth book? We trust Dumbledore. And now he does too. Okay? So, Aberforth goes on and tells them the backstory about his sister, his mother, Grindelwald and such. 567. Aberforth, tears down his face. Says, you know, and Albus was free, wasn't he? Free of the burden of his sister, free to become the greatest wizard. Harry says, he was never free. What does Harry mean? Not her, not them, me, take me. <laughs> Aberforth, then why didn't he tell him to hide when D Hermione says Dumbledore loved Harry? Why didn't he say to him, take care of yourself, here's how to survive? Harry says, because sometimes you've got to think about more than your own safety. Sometimes you've got to think about the greater good. Now, does Harry know at this point what that really means? No. He doesn't know what. He's got to die for the greater good. This is war. You're 17. Awful lot of 17 year olds went off to war in 1917, in 1914, in 1939. All right? So, the lost item, we're going to essentially skip. Who's the lost items? Uh, Rowena Ravenclaw. Ravenclaws. How did the Bloody Baron become the Bloody Baron? He's why did he stab himself? Because he killed Because he, okay. We get the sacking of Severus Snape. And Harry's back at Hogwarts secretly. A couple pages in. Uh, about 115 pages on. About 115 pages, uh, about, I don't know, three or four pages in that chapter, the sacking of Severus Snape. McGonagall catches the Caro twins. Okay, and Amika says we'll blame it on you know one of the students, and he spat in her face. Harry pulled the cloak off himself, raised his wand, and said, "You shouldn't have done that." Harry, Crucio, the Death Eater was lifted off his feet. He writhed through the air like a drowning man, thrashing, howling in pain, and then with a crunch and a shattering glass, he smashed in the front of a bookcase and crumpled. Harry, I see a Beltrix mint, the blood thundering through his brain. You need to really mean it. That's not, let me rephrase. Is that righteous anger? I think so. I think he yeah. is. Potter, Potter, you're, what? Potter, that was foolish. He spat at you. Potter, that was very gallant of you. <laughs> but don't you, I mean, she's like, well done. I mean, that's a true Gryffindor there. I mean, okay. Harry, yeah, I do. He tells her Voldemort's on the way, time's running out, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Percy comes back, right? You knew he was going to. Percy comes back uh, around page, what, 602, 605, somewhere around there. I was a fool. I was an idiot. I was a pompous prat. I was a, and Fred finishes the sentence for him. Ministry-loving, family-disowning, power-hungry moron. 
Yes. <laughs> Percy says. Fred says, it's fine. <laughs> Thirty. So I saw an interesting theory uh, online. Do you think he'd earned the imper- uh, Imperius curse? Uh, he was just Before? Curious. Yeah. No. He was curious. It was, a, it was a theory I saw online. No, I think we knew everything we need we need to know about Percy when Harry sees him reading that book about prefects who gained power in flourishing bonds. Battle of Hogwarts. So, we get the battle, we get the students, you know, um, evacuating stuff, except for those who are going to fight. We see the Slytherins all, you know, escorted out. And very last page of the chapter. Let's see if I can get anybody in tears tonight. It usually happens. There's a big boom. Wall caves in. And somebody yells, no, 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 Fred, no. And Percy was shaking his brother, and Ron was kneeling beside them, and Fred's eyes stared without seeing the ghost of his last laugh still etched upon his face. The world had ended. So why had the battle not ceased? The castle fallen silent in horror, and every combatant laid down their arms. Harry's mind was in free fall, spinning out of control unable to grasp the impossibility, because Fred Weasley could not be dead. The evidence of all his senses must be lying. If Fred Weasley could die, then what? Everybody could die. And then a body falls past the hole below the wall. And it's Harry who says, Percy, get up. I'm going to skip quite a bit again. It's 125 pages on. We see Snape and Crookshank shows up. Page 655. We see Snape with Voldemort. And Voldemort says, I got a problem. It doesn't work. He's holding the Elder Wand. It doesn't work for me. Snape flies. You've done fantastic magic. Extraordinary. No, I performed my usual magic. It's only extraordinary to you. <laughs> I am extraordinary, but this wand no, hasn't revealed the wonders it has promised. I feel no difference between this and the one I got from Ollivander. No difference. He says, you know why I called you back from the battle? Uh, no. Let, let me go. Let me find Potter. No. Skip a bunch of the talk. My elder wand cannot serve me properly, Severus, because I am not its true master. The elder wand belongs to the wizard who killed its last owner. Wrong again. He doesn't He doesn't ever get all the facts. He gets part of the truth. The Elder Wand belongs to the wizard who killed his last owner. You killed Albus Dumbledore. While you live, Severus, the Elder Wand cannot be truly mine. The Elder Wand wasn't even in Dumbledore's hand when he killed him, was it? Nope. So, cannot be any other way. I must master the wand, Severus. Master the wand and Master Potter at last. And there's Nagini and there's a cage and I regret it. Sorry, old boy. <laughs> Harry reveals himself. Take it, take it. And he puts his memories into a flask. And his last words to Harry, look at me. The green eyes found the black. And he was dead. Chapter 33, Prince's Tale. So Harry's got his memories. Now, now does what does he know he must do? I gotta find a pensive, right? Why not just oxio pensive? <laughs> I mean, it's a little ways away, but still. He's gone farther. Yeah, he's gone farther. So he goes up to Dumbledore's office and finds the pensive. And what do we see? The truth behind Snape. Truth behind Snape? Truth behind Snape and Lily? Petunia? 
Why does she hate everything that is strange and mysterious so much? No, it's not because Snape showed it to her. Because she wasn't allowed into it. She wanted it. When Dumbledore says, remember my last in the Howler, that might refer to the letter that he delivered with Harry. But what does last imply? Bingo. He's written Petunia before. Maybe not before the Howler, but before she gets that last letter when Harry's delivered. What has she written? What has Dumbledore written to her? I don't want to get in the heart. I won't. Please, please, please. I'll do anything. No, you can't. How magical is she? About as magical as this floor. <laughs> right? And watch it rise up. You know? <laughs> right? She wants that more than anything. So that is what she blocks off because she cannot have it. And anything to do with that, she blocks off. Okay? So we see all these memories. Was Snape Lily's first love? No. Lily was Snape's. And only. Now, I once had a student in London, and maybe some of you agree with this. If you do, you're wrong, but. <laughs> uh, who I mean, man, she just went on a tear last day of class. How oh, Snape was this misogynist, and he was sick and twisted, and this isn't love. This is blah 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 blah. Okay, um, I didn't think so, and quite a few of the other students did. I think there were one or two who were kind of you know on her side, but I mean, her whole thing was, you know, Snape didn't love the real Lily. He loved his idea that he had created of Lily. I have no idea what she was talking about. I'm just throwing this out there, you know. To, so, so he sees his father in the, you know, in Snape's memories and such. Okay, he sees her interaction with his father a little bit. He sees Snape come to Dumbledore and tell him what he's done, and he asks Dumbledore to protect Lily. And when Dumbledore says, I, I, I can't, can't you ask for some mercy for Lily in exchange for her son? That is, can't you ask your master to kill the child of the woman you love and let you have the woman? I, I have. What does that show us? Snape's not a nice guy. He's willing to ask Dumbledore, uh, Voldemort, kill the boy but let me have his mother. Kill the husband too. Let me have the mother. <laughs> and Voldemort won't. So what does that tell us? James and Lily, they were part of the plan from the beginning. But, but doesn't it yep, say but, that he expects Lily to get out of the way from Harry? Move, you silly girl, he says. In Harry's memories. Move! No, no, not Harry. Take me instead. Take me instead. So he was going to. So, Dumbledore says, or Snape then says, protect them. She and James put their faith in the wrong person. They showed Malfoy, bad faith. That's what Malfoy means, okay? Rather like you, Severus, weren't you hoping that Lord Voldemort would spare her? Her boy survives. Because Dumbledore's just like, she's dead. You want to see her? I got pictures. <laughs> Here, open that wound. <laughs> you know. <laughs> if you loved Lily Evans, if you truly loved her, then your way forward is clear. Well, notice what he's telling him. You want penance? You want absolution? You want to try to undo what you've done? You've got to protect this kid. Okay, okay. But you can't tell Dumbledore. Never tell. This must be between us. Swear. I cannot bear pot Potter's son. I want your word. My word that I shall never reveal the best of you? In other words, Snape is saying, 
I want everybody to think what of me? I'm bad. I'm bad. I'm not the Michael Jackson version of bad. I'm horrible. <laughs> I'm a rotten SOB. And it's almost like he creates a persona to be that. I'm not saying that's not the way he is. Just look at what he says to Hermione with the teeth. I mean, but he's not a nice is person. That, is that the persona? I don't think so. I think that's Snape. You don't think he takes off his black clothes tonight? He takes a bubble bath. Puts on his grip. No, I don't think he does. Okay. So, they keep talking. Dumbledore, we see, talks about the ring. I was a fool. I was tempted. Tempted for power. Okay. So, keep going. They talk about Draco. Are you intending to let him kill you, Snape asks? Certainly not. This is 663 or so. Certainly not. You must kill me. Long silence. You want me to do it now? <laughs> or wait? No, not yet. I dare say the moment will present itself in due course. Given what has happened tonight, we can be sure it will happen within a year. Now, this is before Dumbledore goes to get Harry on Harry's birthday in Harry's sixth year. If you don't mind dying, says Nate, why not let Draco do it? The boy's soul is not yet so damaged. I would not have it ripped apart on my... What about me? <laughs> Hello? Think of me? My soul? You alone know whether it will harm your soul to help an old man avoid pain and humiliation. Notice what comes first in those two things. Dumbledore is saying, by, by the time it's your time to do this, I'm going to be what? Almost dead. I'm going to be incapacitated and in pain. Okay? Snape nods. Why? Because now he's got to do what? Not only he has to kill Dumbledore, what has to come before that? The unbreakable vow. So, they keep talking. Dumbledore, Lord Voldemort's soul, maimed as it is, cannot bear close contact with a soul like Harry, like a tongue on frozen steel, like flesh in flame. Souls? We were talking of minds. In the case of Harry and Voldemort, to speak of one is to speak of the other. That is, not souls and minds. I don't think that's what Dumbledore means. I think Dumbledore means... When we talk about Harry and Lord Voldemort, when you talk about Harry, you're talking about Lord Voldemort. When you talk about Lord Voldemort, you're talking about Harry. Why? Harry's got a bit of Voldemort in him, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, Voldemort has a bit of Voldemort. and Voldemort has a bit of Harry in him. What's the prophecy say? Neither can live while the other survives. Neither can live. Both have to die. All right? Hmm. So, Harry must not know until the last final moment. Not until it is necessary. Otherwise, you won't have the strength to do what he must do. What's the strength to do what he must do? Die. Kill me! <laughs> what must he do? That's between Harry and me. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Because he never told Harry that, right? There will come a time when Voldemort will seem... Okay, and he talks about the snake. So the boy must die. Part of Lord Voldemort lives inside Harry. It is that which gives him the power of speech with snakes and a connection with the Voldemort. While that fragment of soul and missed by Voldemort remains attached to and protected by Harry, Lord Voldemort cannot die. Okay, so fast forward. Harry goes into the forest. What dies when Voldemort does Avada Kedavra? It's the part of Voldemort. The Horcrux. Horcrux. Not the Horcrux. Harry's the Horcrux. Harry doesn't die. It's the bit of soul in. Okay, so that dies. Yes. Is the reason that? Souls is because Harry was acting like 
to his soul's highest power by sacrificing himself. Wait, I've never understood how Yisrael yes. would just kill him. Yes and no. Mostly yes, just a tiny bit no. What's the tiny bit no? What's the thing that's keeping Harry alive? Well, my thought is Daniel did him as well because I thought he was the elder one. Harry's the rank one and he's the elder one. I thought it was the elder one. True. Uh, so there's another mother, aspect to it. What did you say, Samuel? Uh, his mother's protection is keeping him alive. His mother's protection is keeping him alive. That is what is now flowing in Voldemort's veins. So, by taking Harry's blood into himself, when he goes to kill Harry, he makes it impossible for him to kill Harry. But, he could kill Harry once that bit of himself that's in Harry is gone. Okay? So, so the boy must die, and Voldemort must, kill, must do it. That's essential. And, and this is for Lily? <laughs> you have to keep him alive for Lily? We protected him because it's been essential to teach him, to raise him, to let him try strength. The connection between them goes stronger. In other words, it's all been to prepare him for what? As I've been suggesting, to teach him how to die. You kept him alive so he can die at the right moment. Don't be shocked, Severus. I mean, how many men and women have you watched die? Kind of an ouch since the beginning of this book begins. This book begins. With him watching, and he can't do a thing to stop cheering for him. So, since Harry is a horcrux, uh, how come he can be harmed by things that aren't basilisk venom and fiend fire? Wait, say that again? How come he can be? How come, yeah, how come he can be punched, like in the face, and get a bloody nose? Or can he just not be See, killed? I mean, Horcrux lives in an object. I mean, an object yeah, Horcrux lives being. in an object. And what does Dumbledore say about putting a Horcrux in a living object? It's unadvisable. It's unadvisable. You don't, you don't, that's why you put him in a locket. Okay? Because a human person could still get an arm cut off. And then what happens? <laughs> you know? Okay? So, Harry leaves. Now he knows. I gotta die. Oh, by the way, who sent the silver dough? Snake. Okay. The forest again. Harry understood at last that he was not supposed to survive. His job was to walk calmly into death's welcoming arms. Along the way, he was supposed to dispose of Voldemort's remaining links to life. So that when at last he flung himself across Voldemort's path, did not raise a wand to defend himself, the end would be clean. Neither would live, neither could survive. It's how a lot of hero stories end, right? The hero dies, but the enemy dies as well. Beowulf. Beowulf, exactly. Okay? So, this cold-blooded walk, a couple paragraphs down, would require a different kind of bravery. The kind of bravery it takes to walk into an arena. Okay? And Harry starts to think. Because now he's slowly more and more aware of how wonderful it is to be alive. Why had he never appreciated what a miracle he was? Brave, brain and nerve and bounding heart. Kind of an echo of that Christmas morning narration. Okay. So Harry makes his way down. And as he makes his way across, you know, he sees Jenny, he sees Neville. He hears Jenny comfort a little girl. Ripples of cold undulated over Harry's skin. He wanted to shout out. This is around 695. He wanted to shout out. Wanted Jenny to know he was there, but he doesn't. Wanted to be stopped, to be sent back home, but he was home. Hogwarts was the first and best home he had known. He and Voldemort and Snape, the abandoned boys, had all found home there. And he keeps thinking, middle of the next page, probably. Paragraph begins, a swarm of dementors. It's not easy to die. Every second he breathed, the smell of the grass, the cool air on his face was so precious to think that people had years and years time to waste, so much time it dragged. And here, 
He's clinging to every second. He pulls the snitch out. I open up the clothes. Well, this is the clothes. I mean, this is the ending. And he puts it to his lips. Cracks open. And there's the resurrection stone. Crack down the vertical line representing the elder wand. A triangle and circle, circle representing the cloak and the stone were still discernible. It did not matter about bringing them back, for he was going to join them. And what does he see? There's James, there's Lily, there's Lupin, there's Severus. James, same height as Harry, Harry. Same clothes when he died. Hair untidy. Sirius, tall and handsome. Younger. Notice Sirius doesn't look emaciated. <coughs> Lupin, younger too, much less shabby, hair thicker and darker. Lily, big, wide, stupid grin on her face. We've been so brave. What does that tell us? That she's been watching. She's, no, she's been aware. It's like she's been, Harry's been in a fishbowl. And going, Come on, Harry, you can do it. Die well. <laughs> Die properly. Die for the world, you know. He couldn't speak. James, you're nearly there. Come on, son. Do it. Very close. We're so proud of you. Harry's like, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Does it hurt, though? <laughs> I mean, yeah, a scale of 1 to 10. What's the pain level here? I mean, sorry, the office tech over there. So how's your pain level here? It's dying? Serious? Not at all. Quicker and easier than falling asleep. Let me read for you. A poem come on, by John Dunn. I actually wrote my dissertation on. I didn't write my dissertation on. I edited this poem along with a bunch of his other poems called Death Be Not Proud. John Dunn, a 17th century uh, British poet and priest, preacher of St. Paul's Cathedral. His sermons were so popular that people would stand up on the porch outside to listen. And they could run up to three hours long. This guy is an amazing speaker. Anyways, death be not proud, the son of called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, that is, rest and sleep are images of death, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow. If we get pleasure from images of death, how much more pleasure will we get from the real thing? Pretty good idea. And soon as our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. What did he write on Dobby Stone? Here lies Dobby, a free elf. Right? Thou art slave, death. Death is slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men. Notice, death doesn't act on its own. It's a slave to these things. And death with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Pop your charms. He's talking about drugs. Opium. Why swellst thou then? What did Sirius say? Quicker and easier than falling asleep. The whole image Dunn is using in here, the end, by the way, one short sleep past. We wake eternally, and death shall be no more. It's one of the things St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Death, thou shalt die. The last enemy is death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? St. Paul says right after that. Serious. Quicker and easier than falling asleep. I, I don't know if I completely agree with Sirius in saying that. He was a dick by a lot of scholars. He just like passed through it. Didn't yeah, it was easy for him. Yeah. I mean, for him. So, from his experience, yeah, it was easy. 
Notice, Lily doesn't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Remus doesn't say, oh, No, Sirius, I think you're wrong there. It's rather painful for me. Of course, what do they want to say to Harry? I mean, yeah, I get that. But they want to encourage him. But the, it's, he's <laughs> asking about the not the he, exactly. He's talking about the physical going from one place to another. Totally painless. Okay? And he'll want it to be quick. He wants it over. That is, it's 16 years too late. I didn't want you to die, Harry says to Lupin. Harry's last words to Lupin, other than when they came through, you know, the portal and all that. You're a coward. These words came without his volition. Any of you, I'm sorry. Because his understanding was what? Voldemort was after me. Dad, you shouldn't have died. Mom, you shouldn't have died. And then he says to Lupin, and right after you'd had your son. Puts Lupin in who else's shoes? James's and Lily's. That's why the book ends the way it does. With the epilogue, because what do we see? We see another orphan whose parents were killed by Voldemort going off to Hogwarts. Little Teddy Lupin. <laughs> Lupin, I'm sorry too. Sorry I will never know him. But he will know why I died, and I hope he will understand I was trying to make a world in which he could live a happy what did Harry say after Lupin left? Parents should only leave if they have to. Lupin is saying, some things are worth dying for. Harry is saying, by walking to the forest, some things are worth dying for. Like what? Greater love hath no man than this, Christ says in the Gospel of John, I think it is, than to lay down his life for his friend. Who is your friend? And he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Okay. So, he goes in. There's Voldemort. Harry says, I'm here. Hagrid says, Harry, no. <clears throat> Chapter 35. He wakes up in King's Cross. Why in King's Cross? Because it's where his magical journey started. Where his magical journey started. It's where his magical journey started. Did get to choose where he departs from or to? It's a way station. You go to King's Cross to go places. He's going to go somewhere. Notice it's not the end point. It's the starting point of a journey. Okay. Nobody else is there to begin with. Notice that. Notice what happens in the opening couple of pages. She's brilliant for this. He lay face down, listening to the silence. He was perfectly alone. Nobody was watching. Nobody else was there. He was not perfectly sure that he was there himself. A long time later, or maybe no time at all, it came to him he must exist. It must be more than disembodied thought. Why? Because he's lying. And if he's lying, then there must be a him physically somehow there. So he has a sense of touch. And there's something that he's touching. So once he thinks this, he's suddenly conscious he's naked. Like, hello. <laughs> Wasn't naked before. Convinced as he was of this total solitude, didn't concern him. But it did intrigue him slightly. Like, why am I naked? <laughs> he wondered whether he would be able to see. And he opens his eyes. And he discovers, I, I do have eyes. So I'm naked and I have eyes. And he lay in a bright mist. Notice it's a mist. This fog-like stuff is all around him. His surroundings were not hidden by cloudy vapor. Rather, the cloudy vapor had not yet formed into surroundings. Why? We're getting, literally, as Aaron pointed out at the beginning of class when I brought this up, we are getting literally Harry's rebirth. A child, a baby, does not know what its surroundings are when it first opens its eyes. When does it learn those? Book. Book. When 
parents start to teach children things. Elbow, wrist, hand, window, sky, bird, look at the doggy. And you do that again and again and again. And that idea, that meaning of that thing gets associated with the thing pointed to. It gets imprinted in. Until then, the child sees something but has no idea what it is. Harry sees, but he doesn't see anything. Why? His mind hasn't made sense of it yet. And once he's aware he hasn't made sense of it yet, what does his mind do? He turns it into King's Cross. He turns it into a place that took him to another world. It's a, yeah, this is metaphorical. Because when he goes back, he has to wear glasses. And he has a scar. This is what kind of rebirth? Spiritual. It's a spiritual rebirth. Right. So, he sits up, his body appeared unscathed. He touches his face. He's not wearing glasses anymore. And then he hears a sound. Small, soft thumpings of something that flat flails and struggle. Pitiful noise. And for the first time, he thinks, I wish I had clothing on. Because it's like, something might be watching me. And boom, there's Rose. Appear. He puts him on. He hears that noise again. He turns and he looks around. Was he in some great room of requirement? Ooh, that's kind of scary. <laughs> depending on how you define requirement. The longer he looked, the more there was to see. Great domed glass ceiling like there is at King's Cross. Perhaps it's a palace. He hears the noise and he looks at it again. Now he realizes it's a great hall. Right? He recoils. He spotted the thing that was making the noises. It had the form of a small naked child curled on the ground. Its skin raw and rough, flayed looking. It lay shuddering under a seat where it had been left, unwanted, stuffed out of sight, struggling for breath. What is it? It's Voldemort's Horcrux. It's the piece of Voldemort's soul that was in Harry. Notice, it's unwanted. Could be. We're, when we see Voldemort in book four, before he's returned to the body, he's in the shape of a baby. And and uh, Pettigrew drops it in the cauldron. Harry's like, let it die, let it die. You know? Here, however, what? What does Harry want to do? He, no, he wants to help it. He doesn't go... <laughs> put it out of its misery, right? He wants to, and then he hears, you cannot help. He spun around, and there's Dumbledore. Harry, let's walk. Hmm. Harry walked, but you're dead. Yep, then I'm dead too. Hmm, are you? <laughs> That's the question. On the whole, dear boy, I think not. On the whole, I think means completely body and soul no. Not yet. Totally. I mean, but I'm getting your yeah, I'm getting your drift. Hold on though. Why is he not totally dead? The Horcrux was killed. Harry's Dumbledore's gonna say you can go on and you can go back. There's still a physical like tie to the world. There's a physical tie to the world. How? Because <clears throat> Voldemort's still breathing, and his heart is still beating, and he's beating Harry's blood. Yeah. 
it's, it's funny because like Harry, Voldemort can't touch Harry without his blood, but then he can't kill Harry because he has his blood. And that's probably why Dumbledore gets that look of victory when Harry tells him what Dumbledore said, what Voldemort said and did. That Dumbledore realizes at that point, got him. Got him. Now, now we just have to keep Harry alive until the last moment. And then Harry needs to know, now you can die. <laughs> okay. Okay, so they talk. Am I meant to I meant to let him kill me? And that will I think have made all the difference. I meant to let him Harry offered himself as what? Sacrifice. We didn't talk about the scene. Where did Voldemort say? I give you an hour. Bury your dead, take care of your wounded, and Harry Potter better meet me in the Forbidden Forest or no hold barred, no mercy, everybody dies. And Harry's thinking what? All these people who already died on my account, not anymore. Once he knows everything that's going to happen. So now he walks in, he offers himself freely as the sacrifice. He meant, what has he just done? He did exactly what his mother did for him. And he's going to explain that to Voldemort, right? He's going to say, you don't learn. You're supposed to be the greatest, smartest, wisest, not wisest, greatest, smartest, you know, but you don't learn. He did the awesome villain speech. He did the awesome villain speech, you know. He dialogued, monologue, sorry. So, Harry, I let him kill me, didn't I? Dumbledore, you did. So the part of the soul that was in me? Come on, come on Harry, come on. Show me you're smart. It's gone? Yes, you, he destroyed it. Your soul is whole, complete your own. But then, and Harry looks at the part of Voldemort. But that, what is that? Something that is beyond either of our help. Notice, I think at least could be wrong, Dumbledore is implying, but if I could help it, Harry, I would. But I can't. It also kind of sounds like he tried. Yeah, he tried. The old argument. Like, not Voldemort, Dumbledore, I did. He tried to help it. Could be. So if Voldemort used a killing curse, how can I be alive? Come on, I think you know. Come on, Harry. Think back. He took my blood. Yes. He took your blood, rebuilt his living body with it, your blood in his veins, Harry. Lily's protection inside both of you. He tethered you to life while he lives. But now, he's not tethered to life in Harry. Get rid of all the other Horcruxes, Voldemort can be killed. How can he be killed? You can kill him with a Vada Kedavra, you can kill him with a hand grenade, you can kill him with a bazooka, you can kill him with a shotgun. You can kill him all kinds of ways. Chop his head off. It'll be a white, you know, a knife and go all crazy on him. So, Harry said, wait, I thought it was the other way around. You were the seventh Horcrux, Harry, the Horcrux he never meant to make. He had rendered his soul so unstable, it broke apart when he committed those acts of insanity. So they go on and they talk about it. Talk a bunch. So, Dumbledore tells Harry about, you know, Big Notice and all those guys. And how he wasn't to be trusted with power, page 719 and such. Okay. It says, but you are the true master of death. You possess, this is 720 or 721. You possess, uh, you're the true master of death because the true master does not seek to run away from death. He accepts that he must die and their stuns, understands there are far, far worse things in the living world than dying. And he's not talking about things like Dementor's kisses. What are worse things in the living world than dying? Not feeling love. Losing a loved one? Not feeling love. Losing a loved one? Being abandoned? Losing one's integrity? Is one's integrity worth dying for? That is, are you willing to say, no, I will not go against X, Y, Z. Kill me instead. I think that's what Dumbledore is saying. So, Harry says, I've got to go back. Don't, haven't I? Up to you. What do you mean? I've got a choice? Oh, yeah. 
We're in King's Cross. Think of what that implies, by the way. It's another one of those images. Okay? And it also implies you can go a variety of places, Harry. I think if you decided not to go back, you would be able to, let's say, uh, board a train. And if you haven't read it before, along with Tolkien's little essay on fairy stories, he wrote a short story to demonstrate it. It's the only time he ever does anything like this. And the, the short story is called Leaf by Niggle. And it's entirely an allegory from a guy who doesn't like allegory. And it's written totally to demonstrate that short story. And in that short story, a guy gets on a train and has to take a journey. It's all about purgatory and the way to heaven. Okay? But on the basis of the, the um, fairy story essay, Harry, where would it take me? Notice, he doesn't spell out where. But Voldemort's got the Elder Wand. Yep. You want me to go back. I think if you choose to return, he may be finished for good. I can't promise it. But you have less to fear from returning than he does. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living. And above all, those who live without love. Is he telling Harry something there about what to do? Who, Voldemort is the one who lives without love. So how can he show him pity? Give him death. Give him death? That way? Or what's Harry going to say to him? Try for some remorse. I've seen the real you. Notice, Dumbledore says you can't do anything about this right here. He can do something about that. That man standing opposing him. So, Harry goes back. Who lies for him? <whistles> lies through her teeth. What's Voldemort repeatedly say? Don't lie to me. Lord Voldemort always knows. Liar. <laughs> so. Well, I also think because she was not ever a true follower. Okay, so even if she wasn't a true follower, he should have been able to see right through her lie. Well, he could just see that he was just his motherly love. Yeah. I don't know. So Harry goes back. Page 738. Says, you won't be killing anyone else tonight. we got 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 16 minutes. Easy. You won't be killing anyone else tonight. You won't be able to kill any of them ever again. This page 738. Don't you get it? I was ready to die to stop you hurting these people, but you did not. I meant to, and that's what did it. I've done what my mother did. They're protected from me. Haven't you noticed how none of the spells you put on them are binding? You can't torture them. You can't touch them. You don't learn from your mistakes, riddle. Oh, yeah, ooh. <laughs> Do you dare? Yes, I dare. I know things you don't know, Tom Riddle. And you gotta imagine people, because they're standing in the great hall, and there's all kinds of people. They're going, "What are you calling?" <laughs> I cleaned a plate that said, "Want to hear some more before you make another big mistake?" Voldemort and Harry walking in a circle. You know, oh, love again. Come on, Dumbledore's favorite solution: love, which he claimed conquered death. The love did not stop him falling from the tower and breaking like an old waxwork. Love which did not prevent me stamping out your mudblood mother like a cockroach. And nobody seems to love you enough to run forwards this time and take my curse. So what will stop you dying now when I strike? Harry, one thing. Voldemort, if it's not love that will save you this time, you must believe you have some magic I do not. Or else a weapon more powerful. Harry, I believe both. So you have magic that I don't have? You? 17-year-old punk, than I, Lord Voldemort, you know. More than Dumbledore ever, oh, he dreamed, he knew more than you. You mean he was weak, too weak to dare. No, he was clever, a better wizard, a better man. I brought about the death. He says, no, you thought you did, but you were wrong. Dumbledore's dead, etc., etc. Yeah, Dumbledore's dead. 
He chose his own manner of dying, chose it months before he died. And you thought it was your servant. Severus Snape wasn't yours, Harry says. He was Dumbledore. He was, oh, we could use what Harry says to Scrimgeour. Dumbledore's man through and through. You never saw Snape cast a Patronus, did you? It was a dove, the same as my mother's, because he loved her for nearly all of his life, from the time when they were children. You should have realized he asked you to spare her life, didn't he? Well, he just desired her. It was sex. It was nothing else, no. Of course you told him that. He was Dumbledore's spy from the moment you threatened him. Dumbledore was already dying. Snape finished him. Doesn't matter. Shut up and listen. Yeah. I killed Severus Snape three hours ago. I am the master of the death stick. No. Before you try to kill me, I'd advise you to think about what you've done. Think and try for some remorse, Riddle. What? Of all the things that Harry had said to him, beyond any revelation or taunt, nothing had shocked Voldemort like this. Harry saw his pupils contract the thin slit, saw the skin around his eyes widen. Why? Why does that shock him so much? I think Voldemort knows exactly what Harry is suggesting and what it will do. It's your one last chance. It's all you've got left. I've seen what you'll be otherwise. Be a man. Try, try for some remorse. You dare? You dare what? You dare to offer me redemption? You dare to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? You dare to insult my manhood? You dare to insult my manhood? You know. Yes, I dare, because Dumbledore's last plan hasn't backfired on me at all. It's backfired on you. The one still isn't working properly for you, because you murdered the wrong person. Snape was never the true master. He never defeated Dumbledore. Draco defeated Dumbledore. The true elder of the master, master of the elder wand, or elder of the master wand, both work, was Draco Malfoy. Doesn't matter. I'll take care of Draco when I'm done with you. So it all comes down to this, says Harry. It's almost like she's channeling the author and filmmaker of the Dirty Harry movies. You feel lucky today, punk? <laughs> Harry. All comes down to this, doesn't it? Does the wand in your hand know its last master was disarmed? Have you fired six bullets? Or is there a seventh, you know? Because if it does, I am the true master of the Elder Wand. If the wand in your hand knows, then no matter what you do, it won't act properly against me. Harry doesn't actually... Harry doesn't even have to do Expelliarmus. He could go, try again. Do over, you know. A red glow burst suddenly, a red glow burst suddenly across the enchanted sky above them. Why? The sun just came up. As an edge of dazzling sun appeared over the still sill of the nearest window. The light hit both of their faces at the same time. So that Voldemort was suddenly a flaming blur. Harry heard the high voice as he too yelled his. And he points at Draco's wand. At Voldemort. Avada Kedavra and Spelliarmus. Bang! Golden flames. Voldemort's green jet met Harry's own spell. The Elder Wand flew high in the air. Dark against the sunrise. Tom Riddle hit the floor with a mundane finality. What's mundane mean? Common, everyday, ordinary. It's like... And he's not twitching. He's nothing. Voldemort was dead, killed by his own rebounding curse. And Harry stood with two wands in his hand. Notice the wand... Harry's. Imagine, or imagine missing that. Oxio, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's Harry. <laughs> like, right. Everybody's watching. Yeah, but it's Harry. I mean, he, maybe with his mouth. Yeah. Anyways, 
The sun rose, we're told, steadily over Hogwarts. Why does it happen like that? Why does it happen just as the sun breaks up, breaks over the sun, the hills? It's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's a new beginning. The war is over. Isn't it also with the red glow? Isn't it um, like whenever blood is spilled in a battle or something like that, people say the red sun is rising? Well, red a red sun often implies before a battle it's going to be a messy battle. What else is it though? It's red and gold. Can you also say that's a new catastrophe? Is that why they Oh yeah, huge new catastrophe, right? Um, but the, whose colors? It's Gryffindors. It's Griff the real Gryffindor, you know, who's living through Harry. And what do the people want? They wanted him there with them, their leader and symbol, their savior, Patronus Potter, and their guide. And he does what? He does like Katniss Everdeen does in the one um, Hunger Games book. I did a lecture, three-hour lecture one place one time about those books. And he's walking around and people are reaching up. I mean, the comparisons with Christ are pretty strong. People are looking for what from Harry? Healing. Is he touching them and going, behave? No, it's not doing that. And they're not getting healed like that. But they're they're trying to do that. He must speak to the bereaved, clasp their hands, sorry, clasp their hands, witness their tears, receive their thanks, hear the news now creeping in that all the people who have been under a period's curses is gone. And the innocent Azkaban were being released. Kingsley Shackleborn to the new temporary minister of magic. Harry says, I want some peace, etc., etc. Okay. Yep. Why do you think he does? He doesn't want that much power, and what else? Think of the title of this course. No one should have that much power. Okay? 19 years later. Who did Harry rescue from the fiend fire? No, Crab and Goyle got pissed. Finally rescued one of them. Yeah, one of them rescue? Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. So, 19 years later. There's only one thing that I think is really necessary about the epilogue. Any guesses? It's when Draco tips his hat. He acknowledges Harry. Not not acknowledges the dirty rat son. <laughs> it's respect. What's that proof of? Invent something. Change. Louder? Invent something that's not. Redemption. They're not all rotten to the core. Even a mouth away. You know, it's a good question. Because when you think about it, 19 years later, Teddy Lupin. Wait, can that be right? Still, even 19 years later, Teddy Lupin is working on it. Yeah, Teddy, isn't Teddy Lupin going off for his first year, though? Yeah, he's like, yeah. Yeah, Victoire. But he still shouldn't be. Because he'd be 18 by this time. He'd be done with Hogwarts. <laughs> What'd you say? No, but if she's only like 16 or 17, she's going off to Hogwarts. Yeah, in which case he's John Rickles. Um, okay. I don't have anything else. If you do, I'll answer questions. If not, I've enjoyed the course. I hope you have. I hope you've learned something. Yes. That's all. Don't forget to turn in your exams. Submit your exams, whichever way you're going to do it. Oh, you mean next Yeah. Just by. <laughs>